half load. Hang out three, charge four. Fire! So this looks like it is some sort of a concerted on September the 11th to attack the World Trade Center that is enemies of freedom committed an act of war against our country. The evidence we have gathered all points to a collection of loosely affiliated terrorist organizations known as Al Qaeda. The leadership of Al Qaeda has great influence in Afghanistan and supports the Taliban regime. Our war on terror begins with Al Qaeda. But it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. The United States has been at war in Afghanistan for 16 years, making it the longest conflict in our nation's history. The war has spanned three administrations and cost hundreds of billions of dollars, but the real price has been paid in blood. More than 2,400 U.S. service members have been killed in country since President Bush declared a war on terror. And by September 2018, kids born the day the Twin Towers fell could be boarding a plane to go fight in a war they weren't old enough to remember the start of. He didn't tell me where he was going. He didn't want to worry me. And so I just kind of went along with it. You know, I was trying to be in ignorant bliss. So how many years does it take? How many bombs need to be dropped and bullets chambered to declare victory? I share the American people's frustration. To see firsthand how the Trump administration's new path forward is playing out in Afghanistan, ABC 10 embedded with conventional and special forces units around the country, seeking the answer to one question. What does winning look like? When you look at the task that we're trying to accomplish here, all this stuff that you, that you have to do to kind of build an army and a, and a police force that's going to be effective over time, you can't just do one or two years and walk away from it. And perhaps no one's had to learn that lesson harder than the United States Marines, who returned to the Taliban stronghold of Helmand Province in 2017. We're not, you know, we're not government advisors. We're not here to build industry or commerce. We're here to put the Taliban to the ground and make them negotiate. This is where bin Laden launched the attacks in, on 9-11. So this is where it all started. And I know we're divided politically on the home front, but uh, this, this, we can't be divided on this. In April 2017, when the Marines first returned to Helmand, long considered to be Afghanistan's most violent and dangerous province, they faced a Taliban insurgency that had overwhelmed the Afghan forces we left behind following the 2014 drawdown. This drawdown will continue, and by the end of next year, our war in Afghanistan will be over. We knew that the security situation had deteriorated significantly since, since our departure in, in 14. So when we were coming back, you know, we, we knew this was a daunting task, and we knew there was a lot to be done. To get a better understanding of what the Marines were up against when they returned to Helmand, and how the situation has evolved in the months since President Trump announced a troop surge as part of his new South Asia strategy. Dealt a lasting defeat. I embedded with the 6th Marine Regiment at Camp Shorab, a modest outpost next door to the Afghan National Army's 215th Corps base. We came into a situation in Helmand Province, in particular around Lashkar Gah, where you know, I guess the verbiage we used was crisis advising. And we had an essential task of not allowing the provincial capital to fall to the Taliban. So it was, it was game on from the moment we got here. As part of the military's broader train, advise, and assist mission, the 300 Marines based at Camp Shorab are tasked with supporting the ANA's 215th Corps and the 505th Zone National Police, a vastly different mission than when Patty Schumacher's son, Victor Du, was deployed to Helmand in 2010. When did he start to show an interest in the military? He talked about it off and on, but the real big thing was, was after 9-11. I believe that was the catalyst for him, that he really was determined to go in. He wanted to be there on the front line. He wanted 
to um, make sure that everyone else was okay, that he felt he could take care of everyone else. When he told, called and told me that he was gonna be placed with 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, he already knew that he would be deployed. 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines were notified they'd be heading into the Taliban heartland of Helmand Province to some of the most violent districts in Afghanistan. It really was the worst part of the war in Sangin, in the Helmand Province of Afghanistan. Um, it was right after um, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines had taken over after the British had left. The BBC reported that almost half of the entire casualties suffered by Britain's task force in Helmand over a six-month period were lost in Sangin, so the Americans took over, and Victor deployed with 5th Marines to Helmand in late September. Within days, the regiment would suffer its first casualty. What was he telling you in those, in those first letters about his time in Afghanistan? He did mention that he was a little scared but that they were well trained and he was ready to do his job. Less than two weeks into Victor's first deployment as a Marine, his regiment suffered their first casualty. That was October 8th. Can you tell me about October 13th? <sighs> Truly the worst day of my life. Figuring everything is okay, and in fact, that morning, someone had just asked me about my son, and I literally had said, no news is good news, that morning. And um, little did I know that that was probably really close to the time that he was killed. The vehicle Victor was riding in was hit by an IED, killing him and the three other Marines inside instantly. It'd be his regiment's greatest loss of life in a single day, but 20 more Marines would die before the three-fifths tour was over. I just couldn't fathom that it was my son, my oldest son, you know, not my Victor. Victor was always able to take care of himself. Uh, again, not really realizing the full capacity of what was going on over there. But rather than have the Marines on the ground shoulder to shoulder with Afghan forces like they were in 2010 during the bloody Battle of Sangin, their support now comes in the form of precision airstrikes that originate here in the Joint Operations Center, a war room equipped with a dozen screens broadcasting various parts of the Helmand battlefield. This is mostly a, the nucleus of the task force, if you will. It's really where the war is happening. Uh, through these screens. While embedded with the six Marines, I was given rare access to film inside the Joint Operations Center and watched as alleged members of the Taliban were targeted and killed in real time. Uh, we looked to identify individuals with either uh, ICOM, like uh, intercom systems, uh, communication devices, or uh, weapons. and. Uh, the cameras are, are close enough that they can identify weapons on individuals as they're um, you know, moving in and on tree lines and along the roads. Instead of us being right next to them, calling in the airstrike, there's, uh, there's guys in here that are calling in those airstrikes from this room. We're giving them that, that extra boost, that, that morale boost and that confidence because I'm a ground guy and uh, love to have the overhead cover of aircraft. If you have it, you feel invincible. Access to this kind of air power has given the Afghan security forces a distinct advantage over the Taliban. It's not just coalition aircraft carrying out the strikes. The Afghan Air Force ATACs, or tactical air controllers, are already calling in targets to their own aircraft, like the MD-530 attack helicopter. Starting back with Operation Maiwan 8 and 9, which were the two most recent operations, we uh, confirmed uh, that successful MD-530 strikes were, were coordinated by the ATACs that went out to the field to support those, those forces. And we were able to, to verify that it actually made a significant difference and allowed friendly forces to gain more ground than they maybe have uh, previously without that air support. A week after ABC-10 left Hellman, the ATACs we spent time with took part in an offensive in Marja, a town amidst Hellman's vast poppy range, about 30 miles south of Camp Shorab. According to U.S. officials, the ATACs used their training to help conduct the first dynamic strike with the Afghan Air Force's A-29 bombers, allowing Afghan security forces to gain more ground and clear over 100 IEDs from the area. How big of a threat are IEDs still uh, in Afghanistan? <laughs> massive. Massive. Th massive threat. That's uh, enemy's go-to. 
And how often are these guys running up against them? Uh, daily. They, every, every mission they go out on, um, route clearance is definitely uh, one of the most important capabilities that the uh, soldiers have out here. According to the most recent Pentagon data, more than half of all U.S. troops killed or wounded in Afghanistan have been victims of improvised explosive devices, and they continue to wreak havoc across the country. In 2011, in the neighboring province of Kandahar, Sacramento native Sergeant Christopher Soulsby, an Air Force Explosive Ordnance Disposal Technician, was tasked with destroying the devices. I tried to uh, explain to myself that being an explosives expert helped him be safer because so many of the guys over there were killed because of IEDs. And rather than being surprised by walking across one, he was actually going to be purposefully searching for them. On May 26th, a few days before Memorial Day, Chris's EOD team went in search of a trailer filled with explosives. As he approached the area with his metal detector, an explosion went off. I'd been on the phone talking to my daughter-in-law. She had mentioned that he had missed uh, one of their communications. I was standing at my computer and looked and there was a CNN um, notification alert in my email that said um, something about an explosion and uh, eight or nine people killed or something like that. So I told her, oh, he's probably going up there, his team's probably going up there checking out that explosion. Come to find out that as she hung up from me, these two guys were coming up the walkway to her house to notify her that Chris was killed. So that CNN report was not a job that he had to go to, but he was talking about him and his team that were killed. During a three-month span in 2017, more than 3,000 people were killed or injured by IEDs in Afghanistan, making it the only country in U.S. Central Command to see an increase in both incidents and casualties from the devices, according to Department of Defense statistics obtained by foreign policy. Despite the rise in IED casualties, the Afghan National Army's 215th Corps Hospital has seen a reduction in patients since the Marines arrived. Brigadier General Hussein Golpaknad, Helmand's regional medical commander, told me that due to the training his physicians have received from the Marines, coupled with good planning and organization, the hospital is now one of the top facilities in the nation. Our enemy is defeated around Helmand, and the only two ways that are left for them to assault us are suicide attacks or by hiring women and children to plant IEDs and detonate them along the roadside. But the fighting is far from over. According to the U.S. officials I spoke with on the ground, it's no less intense than when the Marines returned in spring 2017. In fact, just hours before we arrived at the hospital, a 25-year-old soldier had been brought in with a gunshot wound. He said he'd been shot by Taliban militants during an operation in Goresh. The operation is going excellent, with a high level of cooperation and coordination between different Afghan security forces and coalition forces against the Taliban. As long as the Marines provide us the air support, we can go anywhere we want and we can attack the Taliban. We are in an offensive position right now. It's too early to tell whether the Marines' successes in Helmand will prove to be a watershed in the 16-year-long war. But it's clear that even amid the poppy fields that supply the majority of the global heroin trade and fuel the financial engine of the Taliban, Afghan security forces are winning the fight. You're seeing local Pashtun Afghan security forces rise up against the Taliban. You're seeing them fight side by side with their Afghan army brothers to defeat the Taliban. Um, that's not happening in other provinces, but it's happening in Helmand. And it's huge. Some of the old Marines I spent time with who were on their second and third tours in Afghanistan were quick to tell me that the war they're fighting today hardly feels like a war at all. They no longer patrol outside the wire, and the only face time they get with the locals in Helmand happens on opposite sides of barbed wire fences. When you've seen young Marines die and get uh, maimed or lose limbs, if the Afghans are able and willing to go out and take the fight to the Taliban, then we should let them. I think ADSF is winning the fight here. They're on the offense, they're moving around the battlefield, they go where they want, they do what they want, they support themselves, and that's forced the Taliban to react to them. The level of commitment that we're showing to the Afghan population, that, hey, we're gonna stay until the job's done. We're not putting an artificial timeline, we're not gonna communicate to the enemy that we're gonna leave on this day no matter what. 
we're, no, we're not going to leave till the job's done. A large part of the Marines' success in Helmand has been their ability to provide Afghan ground forces with air power. And if we ever hope to see an end to U.S. involvement in the war, military officials argue a strong Afghan air force is the way to get us there. Taliban does not have air power. The Afghan Air Force will. So that is going to be the difference. That's going to turn the tables and hopefully bring the Taliban to reconciliation. We need to establish irreversible momentum against the enemy. They need to have the assets and the skills to do firepower, mobility, maintenance, logistics, intelligence, information, all those things that we require, the Air Force requires in order to be, uh, to be capable. Where are we in that process? Um, we're doing really well. Going to a condition-based strategy instead of a time-based strategy lets the Afghans know that we're not, you know, we're here until they meet the conditions-based requirements. U.S. officials tout the claim that the Afghan government controls roughly two-thirds of the country. Yet, unlike the progress made by the Marines at Helmand, watchdog groups say Afghan forces are suffering unsustainable casualty rates, while Taliban insurgents still operate in much of the country. I mean, the end state is having a professional and sustainable military that doesn't need us there. It's sort of figuring out what all the wickets are on the way to get there. That's the difficult part. As President Obama began a drawdown of U.S. troops in Afghanistan in 2011, shifting our support and combat operations to a train, advise, and assist mission, one of the main focuses has been bolstering the Afghan Air Force to ensure that if the U.S. were to withdraw its air power, the Afghans could continue to have the edge against their enemies. When you advise, Success is measured differently than maybe a, a typical mission. I've had the unique ability, having been out here so long and been an advisor for so long, to, to see that evolution, see where they started from and where they've come from. Since 2010, advisors like Howard have been working with the Afghans to build a professional, capable, and sustainable air force, which includes training and advising roughly 8,000 of its members on fixed and rotary wing aircrafts. It's kind of like raising a kid. Uh, you know, you start out watching them crawl and teaching them basics. And, and, and seeing them kind of struggle with that initially and then, and then grab a hold of that concept and, and run with it. The Afghan Air Force is equipped with seven different airframes, each with its own mission sets that are unique to Afghanistan. They're not fighting in a, a foreign war, so they're building this capability as they fight a war, which is a monumental task. Their, their pilots that they have here are training in combat. Some of their first missions may be a combat mission, and that's extremely difficult to do. To get a better understanding of what the Afghans are capable of, I was granted access to embed with the Special Missions Wing, the country's only Special Forces Aviation Unit. I will tell you, I personally think uh, the Special Mission Wing is the critical capability for the government of Afghanistan. If they want to prove to the people of Afghanistan that they can fight the Taliban anywhere, at any time, to include during the hours of darkness, this is the organization that enables them to do that. Here on the flight line behind me are MI-17 helicopters. These are part of the special mission wing of the Afghan Air Force. And uh, we're gonna be going up in one of these today uh, to see their capabilities and what the special missions wing uh, is capable of. Developed as Afghanistan's ace counterterrorism aviation unit, the special missions wing air crews operate two airframes. The PC-12, a Swiss turboprop plane, used primarily to gather intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and a fleet of decaying Russian MI-17s that have managed to hold up in the country's harsh conditions. They're, they're not new helicopters. They have plenty of power. They're well suited for Afghanistan for the higher altitudes and the temperature extremes that we see here. They, they just handle kind of like grandpa's old Cadillac. They're very soft. Flying them with any kind of precision takes a lot of practice. Unlike Afghanistan's conventional military and police forces that have been plagued by high desertion rates and struggle to provide sustainable security throughout the country, special forces units have had an impressive amount of success against the Taliban, according to the U.S. officials ABC10 spoke with. We're absolutely seeing results, and there's a lot of things that we do every day that we we cannot share with you, but measurable in the terms of several dozens of tons of, of things taken off the battlefield, named objectives taken off the battlefield every night with every mission. We've got to remember that the Taliban, they're not targetable every night, right? They, they are a smart and thinking enemy, and it is only when everything aligns, uh, time, space, that we can get at them where we can launch the special mission wing. Even with the unit's advances, the Afghans are struggling to recruit and grow the wing quickly. 
meaning a swift withdrawal of U.S. air support, is unlikely to happen anytime soon. To make a usable pilot, they will usually spend about two years just to get their wings. And then they come here, they know how to fly the aircraft, they don't know how to fight the aircraft in time and space against the thinking enemy, right? That in and of itself will take several more years. During multiple interviews with members of the Afghan Air Force, one thing was clear. There's no rush to see the Americans leave and take their air power with them. Well, right now, it's very good that we have our U.S. with us to every mission. We are, we, are, we are so a young country and we started new things right now. So since we are new, we need more coalition and more them to help us. I fight for not my own children, I fight for my own country's children. I hope that when they are joining the Air Force, we have a better Air Force that they don't suffer a lot that, like us. I hope one day we have more, more training, less missions. New images tonight revealing a terrifying escape. As the Taliban and other violent extremist groups up their numbers of high profile attacks, it's hard to believe that the U.S. is getting any closer to winning this war. Military officials ABC 10 spoke with say this shift in tactics is a sign that the insurgents are becoming desperate. But if our aim is to reduce violence and suffering in Afghanistan, we still have a long way to go. I think it's important to go back to why we're here in the first place, right? And we, we ignored Central Asia in the 90s. You know, the Taliban took over here. They invited in transnational groups like Al-Qaeda. We didn't do anything about it. And then that's what gave us 9-11. So our presence here and our efforts here, uh, I think directly protect the U.S. homeland and the homeland of our allies. But our protection has come at a heavy price. According to Human Rights Watch, the United Nations assistance mission to Afghanistan documented 2,640 war-related civilian deaths in the first nine months of 2017. And since the war began, at least 1.7 million people have fled from their homes. Airstrikes, as well as the number of reports of civilian casualties, have also increased as President Trump loosens the military's restrictions on their rules of engagement. From now on, victory will have a clear definition. Attacking our enemies, obliterating ISIS, crushing Al-Qaeda, preventing the Taliban from taking over Afghanistan, and stopping mass terror attacks against America before they emerge. In late December 2017, Vice President Mike Pence made a surprise visit to Bagram Airfield in Afghanistan, where he reiterated President Trump's strategy and the U.S.'s commitment to the fight. We vowed to win this war on our terms, on this soil. And together with our allies, we came here to Afghanistan to liberate its people and prevent the terrorists from ever threatening our homeland again. And we are staying in that fight, and we will see it through to the end. I would love to see this end. I would love to see it end in a way that I want to say everyone is happy, but of the over 7,000, almost 8,000 military members that have died since 9-11, we're always missing a piece of our heart. We're missing that person at our table. For a long time, I would think about uh, different jokes and other emails I would like to send him. That I didn't get a chance to think about the fact that we don't have any time together. Several months after he was killed, Obama made the statement that we were pulling everybody out of Afghanistan. And I muttered to myself, you're a little late. The stories of the dead continue to be told. U.S. service members continue to die, Afghans continue to die, and despite the optimistic narrative being sold on the ground and on Capitol Hill, it's hard to see how the word winning has any place in describing the end to this war. You know, again, whatever your politics are, and I know this is a long-term investment, but if that radical ideology is allowed to come back into places like Afghanistan and take root and have safe haven to plan and plot against the West and the rest of the modern world, that, that's unacceptable. So I, I don't know how long it's going to take, and I can't tell you exactly what victory is going to look like, but I know what defeat looks like, and that is absolutely not something we should allow to happen.